So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I am so excited to have you join us this evening for the first of our virtual lectures in celebration of Lehman Caves National Monument Centennial. Um, so we are the Great Basin National Park Foundation and we wanted to connect people whether or not they could come to the park in this uh, wonderful 100th anniversary year of the monument, which, which led to the founding of the park later. Um, and uh, so we, we thought of having these virtual lecture series and tonight is gonna be a really fun one. So thank you for coming and joining us. My name is Aviva O'Neill. I'm program manager of Great Basin National Park Foundation and we are the nonprofit partner of Great Basin National Park. And our purpose is to connect people to the park and its amazing resources and to help um, the park and uh, help protect and preserve those resources far into the future. Um, so from the deepest caves to the um, tallest peaks to the oldest trees and the darkest skies, um, we are trying to um, help uh, introduce new audiences to the spectacular resources of Great Basin National Park. We do a lot with education outreach and supporting uh, interpretation and um, park programs. Um, we also have a lot around the Dark Sky Initiative. So we um, have, we, we built and managed the um, first and only research grade astronomical observatory located in National Park. Um, so we'd love for you to learn more about us and I'll be sending um, a follow-up email with some links in it so you can learn more. But one thing to learn more about is that this is this virtual lecture series. This is the first one. So there's going to be more. They're going to be taking place the first Wednesday of each month in the spring and summer, early summer. Um, but there's also some in-person events that are happening uh, this early spring and summer. Um, so I'll give you links to those events. Most of them at the park are around living history. And um, it's culminating on August 6th with a big celebration at the park. And that is um, very similar, well, kind of in the essence of the big celebration that happened in 1922 when uh, Lehman Caves National Monument um, became a monument, they had a big celebration. So I invite you to that and we'll give you some more details on that. Um, before we start tonight, I do wanna thank our sponsors. A big thank you to Nevada Energy Foundation, to Nevada Humanities, to the National Endowment for the Humanities and to Robinson Mining Company. And um, of course we're a nonprofit. And so we are only able to do what we can do because of our supporters. So a big thank you to our donors um, who are our members and we call them Guardians of the Great Basin. So if you are on this lecture tonight and you are a guardian of Great Basin, thank you so much. Um, so we're so excited to have Gretchen Baker be our speaker for tonight. She is the park ecologist and cave scientist. And she knows Lehman Caves really like no other person. I mean, she knows it in and out and she knows about the tiny little things about the history um, so much. So I'm so excited to learn from her tonight. Um, before I pass it over to her, there will be question and answer time at the end. So you're probably all familiar with Zoom by now, but just in case, um, if you take your mouse and you hover over your screen, at the bottom will appear uh, you know, a bar that has different things on it. Um, please don't use the raise hand function. We're not gonna use that. Um, but you'll see Q&A. If you have a question anytime when Gretchen's talking, go ahead and put your question in there. Um, it won't bother anyone. It will only come to me. So you just type it in and then you press enter. And then at the end of the program, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. You can put comments in there too, if you'd like. Um, if you have problems with Q&A, you can also use the chat. Uh, the chat's only gonna go to the host. Um, so that's not a problem either. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Gretchen Baker. And once again, thank you so much for joining us at this first of our virtual lecture series. Thank you, Aviva. And we really appreciate what the Great Basin National Park Foundation does and how it helps Great Basin National Park. 
Tonight, I am going to share a, a look, close up look at Lehman Caves. Are you seeing my screen okay? <laughs> yes, we're seeing your screen. I think you're going to put it into the um, PowerPoint. Uh, there we go. There now we, we, you can see it well. All yeah. right. So, yes, you have to have a magnifying glass to look at it close up, right? Maybe, maybe not, but we're gonna just, before we get to the really tiny little things, let's take a broader view and kind of figure out where Great Basin is for those of you who aren't familiar with it. We're located in East Central Nevada and Lehman Caves is within Great Basin National Park and is one of many different caves where you can take cave tours um, hosted by the National Park Service. Lehman Caves is a show cave with over 33,000 visitors each year and has been open to the public since 1885. That makes it Nevada's oldest show cave. And it's just cool to think about that. People have been going into this cave for well over 100 years and seeing the, what the marvels are that are in there. As Aviva mentioned, in 1922, Lehman Caves National Monument was established. And there was quite a turnout for that. They had a big flag raising. And actually on August 6th, there will also be a flag raising at sunrise to help commemorate this centennial event. One of the things I wanna point out here is we see the flag going up. There was a rifle salute down in this area. There was a pond and the orchard and fields down in here. And looking from the other view, we can look up and see that there were quite a few cars that came for that, um, some buildings, and there were no tunnels. So that flagpole was located at that natural entrance right up here. And there's the pole going up. And take a look at the hillside. There aren't so many trees there like there are today. So things have really changed on the outside a lot. On the inside of the cave, though, fortunately, things haven't changed that much. So this is a photo on the left taken in 1928 by John and Mary Walker. And then in 2016, when the National Speleological Society had a convention in Ely, Nevada, they had some folks find these 1928 photos in the Library of Congress and renowned photographer Dave Bennell came out and retook the photos. And I was delighted to see that in almost all of them, the cave was looking identical. It was looking like there really hadn't been much damage despite hundreds of thousands of people coming through the cave and so much time. And so that really made me feel good that the Park Service has been good stewards of the cave. One thing to note in this particular set of photos is the water levels. In 1928, you can see a water line here, but there's no water in the pools. Ever since I've been at the cave, there's always been water in these pools. This is back in the sunken garden area. And I asked a hydrologist about this, and he mentioned that 1928 was the start of the Great Basin Dust Bowl era. And so that's when it really started getting dry. The streams that run off the mountain didn't make it down to the town of Baker. The, a lot of the springs went dry. And there was so much wind, it actually blew up piles of sand that covered barbed wire in places. Once I heard about that correlation with the date and the, those pools being dry, I keep a close look at those pools and they start getting low. I get a little worried because that was such a dry period for such a long time. And, and so may, we may eventually have something like that, but um, the cave may be able to tell us a little bit about what's going on. This is a picture that I recently discovered on Facebook showing the Lehman Caves entrance. And this is no longer the natural entrance. This is the entrance tunnel that was made in the 1930s along with the Wheeler Lodge coffee shop right next to it. Um, so this is a really cool photo showing that so well. And then the lovely manicured grass right by it. We still use this entrance tunnel to go in the cave. Now there is a roof that goes over it and benches underneath, so it looks a little different, um, but that's it's just kind of fun to step back in history and take a look at this. Lehman Caves National Monument was one square mile and surrounded by the Humboldt National Forest. And in the 1960s, they made the Wheeler Peak scenic area and a drive that went up into there. And that is one of the most popular things now for people who visit Great Basin National Park, which was created in 1986 
encompassing Lehman Caves National Monument and also a lot of other things, including magnificent Wheeler Peak, ancient bristlecone pines, and the marvelous night skies we have here, to name a few things. So now the park is about 120 square miles, so quite a bit larger than what the National Monument used to be. So this is a more recent map of Lehman Caves, and I'm delighted that we have this more recent map. It's due to a whole bunch of volunteers who came and spent lots of weekends and nights coming in and to map the cave, um, led by Shane Fire and Cindy Walk. And what we found, even though we checked every nook and cranny, is that they had already found all the parts of the cave, most of them back in 1885, with a few things that were found a little bit later, like the Lost River Passage and the Gypsum Annex that came in some decades later. But we didn't find any other new passages with the remapping. But we did have this, the remapping gave us this really nice profile that has the actual distance from the cave to the surface above it. And this area is called the Epicarst. And that epicarst is where the water trickles down and picks up the calcite and then redeposits it into the beautiful parts that we call the cave. Um, and that really makes Lehman Caves pop. It's such a gorgeous cave. And I feel honored that I have the opportunity to work at Great Basin National Park and spend a lot of time in Lehman Caves. Every time I go through, I see something different. Little side note, we do call it Lehman Caves. We think that Absalon Lehman may have made it plural because he wanted people to think it was bigger and that would attract more people. It is just a singular cave though, but because of its historic name, we still call it Lehman Caves. Lots of people have come to Lehman Caves over the years. And one thing that everybody who goes into the cave has happened to them inadvertently is that they leave a little bit of themselves behind. A little bit of lint. The lint that comes off our clothes and then maybe a few skin cells, maybe a little bit of hair and all that accumulates in the cave. And with the air currents, it can float up and get stuck in between stalactites. It can rest on popcorn. And so it's something that we've had to deal with because if we don't, the cave starts looking really fuzzy. And this isn't the warm kind of fuzzies. This is the fuzzy where you're like, oh, maybe I, yeah, I want to get out my duster. And this lint can be so thick in places that we actually have, I, this is, I found a spot above the music room, it's off the trail, and the lint was so high up there, or it's so thick up there, that I was able to, with my finger, write the word lint into it. Then we cleaned it all up, but I had to take the picture because I was like, this is some really massive lint. So why do we care? Well, not only is it ugly, but lint is also bad for caves. It can change how formations grow. It, it provides an artificial food source for cave biota, like these tiny springtails. And we certainly aren't supposed to feed the wildlife in national parks. And so we definitely don't wanna have those that lint in the cave. So every winter we hold a lint camp. And this is Julie Long, one of my coworkers, giving the orientation talk to this year's group of volunteers who came for Lint Camp. Once everyone gets an orientation and the safety talk, then we go into the cave and they can start delicately brushing the lint off of walls and formations. And it's not complicated. We just use paint brushes. They've got a nice electrostatic charge on them that helps gather up the lint. We use toothbrushes in places where it might be a little wetter. And we just try to use different tools depending on what surface we're working on. And it is surprisingly fun. I don't really love cleaning my house, but cleaning the cave is very good feeling. I feel like I'm getting something accomplished and I can see how I'm making the cave prettier as I do that. And we're lucky to have a lot of other people that feel the same way, getting rid of some of that nasty lint. This year, when we went into the cave, we went in just with black lights. And so that was a really fun experience for all of our volunteers to go into the cave because black lights are a lot dimmer than your regular lights. So you don't see the cave as much. 
but it also lights up the lint and it makes it glow some different colors. And so it really pops out and you can see it better. Some of the volunteers joked like if they started cleaning with their regular lights, then I'd come by with a, a black light in other years and say, oh, there's still some more there. Well, this time we just equipped everyone with black lights so they could see exactly what they were getting into. And especially down low near trails, right off the trail, we saw so much lint. Now, we also focused on trying to get some of the lint off the formations. And this can be a really delicate uh, what thing to do because we don't want to break any of the lectites coming off or any delicate parts. And so we have to be very methodical about getting that lint off. Um, sometimes it's just with little tweezers. Sometimes we try to blow on it softly. Sometimes we use the tiniest little brush we can find. And as you can see from this before and after, before this stalactite was looking kind of fuzzy and afterwards it's looking a lot better. We also find quite a bit of lint in some of the grates that are along the pathway, and so those get cleaned. We also clean part of the trails, and this year, the vol some volunteers from California came and said, hey, we've got a portable power washer. Can we try this out? And we've had volunteers with other great ideas in the past for how to clean the cave better, and so we said, sure, let's give it a try. And so they hooked it up to some water, and they started putting some water on the trail. We had sponges and a tarp to help contain all that water because all the water that was put down, we scrubbed the trail and then we wrung out the sponges into buckets and we took that water all out of the cave because we didn't want to introduce something new into the cave. So it worked really well. And now that slope going down into the Grand Palace is a lot safer to walk on. We encourage all ages to come to our lint camps and we've had the kids do amazing things at them. The kids can get down and they see so well and they're just a joy to work with. So it's been a lot of fun to have kids ranging from pretty young to teenagers come and help at the lint camps. Now, sometimes we get to find really cool things, uh, some old nails, a variety of coins, some wrappers. Uh, and we even found a wheat penny and a buffalo nickel among some of the other coins in what used to be called the wishing well, one of the pools in the cave. We don't um, allow people to throw coins in the cave anymore because that isn't so good for the cave environment, but it was very interesting going through and trying to find all these old coins and um, then taking them to our cultural resource staff so they could document them. It takes a fair bit of gear to put on a lint camp, uh, but what it really takes is a dedication to look for things that you might not expect at first. And that includes some of the algae that we have near the cave lights. So cave lights are something else that's not natural in the cave, and they are there providing chlorophyll or providing energies and the, the Plants can take advantage of and start turning things green. So we have mosses and algae that are growing there. And that's again, providing an unnatural food source for the cave biota. So we want to get rid of it. And we go and every year go and spray a 10% bleach solution to get rid of that algae there. So it's a bit of a time consuming process, but with all the volunteers that come for Lint Camp, it goes relatively quickly. This year, we also tackled another challenge, and that was from carbide lamps. So I'm holding a little carbide lamp here. These were invented in the 1890s, and miners used carbide lamps. You fill the bottom part with carbide and then put a little water in the top, and then you light it. And there's a little striker here, so you can just light it, and then you get a nice flame going. Um, I have tried using this going caving before when I first started my caving career because uh, miners had good success with these and so cavers started using them to go into caves. But if you don't have your ratio of the carbide and water just right, it can kind of bubble up and then you have really hot water running down your face. It's not a pleasant experience. But carbide provides a nice warm light. It is also um, fairly long lasting, but occasionally you need to recharge your carbide. And so over the years, I've noticed in places 
in the cave where we have these carbide dumps. And so it's basically the used up carbide that they dumped out of their um, carbide lamps. And then they would repack it and put some more water in and continue going on in the cave. And so we focused just on a couple areas. This was one at the Sunken Garden. Um, you can see in this section, these are the two stalagmites I showed in that earlier photo in the pools down here. And one volunteer made an astute observation that a lot of the carbide dumps are close to where we have the pools, which makes great sense because they also needed to replenish the water in their carbide lamp. And so there were this many carbide dumps just in this one room that we were cleaning up. And so this is a project that will probably take a few years to get the rest of the carbide out of the cave. And it's toxic to the cave environment, so it's something we don't want to have still in there. None of this would happen unless we had these great volunteers. And so this is um, this year's crew. <coughs> Here are some crews from other years. As you can see by all the grins, we have a lot of fun with, with Lake Camp. Um, it's, it's just a, a really fun experience. And about half the people who come are cavers. And about half the people who come are general public. And it's really fun to have that mix so people can see how cavers do things in caves, which might be a little different than most people would think. We also have a lot of people who return year after year. And we're really grateful for them to uh, help to continue to make the cave looking better. Now, why do they do it? Well, there's a sense of satisfaction of having little parts in the cave you can point out to your friends and family, hey, I cleaned that. There's also some perks we provide, which includes an off-trail experience walking through the Talus Room, which is the largest room in the cave. You also sometimes can see some things that you don't normally see on a faster paced tour, such as when we have a bubble dripping. And this usually happens in the springtime, right around snow melt, and we have a pretty big bubble and you can kind of see that and then the water drips off of it. And this is kind of fun because the photos were taken close together and you can see the, the start of the drip and then, yep, then it's actually dripping. Something else we sometimes see in the springtime are what we call spouters, where the water just spouts out the side of a soda straw. We didn't see them this year, but in some years they, they, we have abundant ones. And so that's been uh, really fun for volunteers to get to experience. And as I mentioned, just having that little spot would be cleaner than it used to be makes you feel amazing. And we never have time in the couple of days that we do it to get it all. So you might get one part clean, but you're like, oh, there's still something to come back and work on. Sometimes there are also evening parties that might include things like furniture caving. Uh, this is when you pretend, pretend that your furniture is a cave and you try to do things like crawl under it. Well, maybe somebody is kneeling up on the chair to make sure that it won't move. Um, so this can be a one way that some cavers um, enjoy the evening. And another big benefit is sometimes during lit camp, you might get to see some cave biota. In this case, it was a pseudoscorpion, which are just really cool creatures. First discovered, this Great Basin pseudoscorpion was first discovered in Lehman Caves in 1930 by the custodian T.O. Thatcher. He was in charge of the cave. Uh, it wasn't identified though until the 1960s by Dr. Muchmore because there just aren't many pseudoscorpion experts. And it's in the order of pseudoscorpions, which is kind of a cousin to the scorpions. But as you notice, there's no stinging tail here. That's why it's called pseudo or false scorpion. So as we look at these tiny little creatures, this is magnified hugely. These springtails are basically the base of the food web in the cave, along with bacteria. And springtails are about the size of a piece of dandruff. You can just imagine how tiny that is. These springtails are called that because they have a little appendage on their abdomen that allows them to spring forward up to 17 times their body length. So you can imagine like if you could do a long jump that was 17 times your height, that would be a pretty good long jump. And these little critters can do that all day long. We have different types of cave organisms in the cave. So the troglobites are the 
the animals that only can live in caves, like this cave millipede. Troglophiles are the animals that love caves, but they can also live in a similar habitat outside. So gray springtails might be one of those. We also have white springtails. They are the troglobites because they have adapted to the totally dark cave environment. And so that's one thing we kind of differentiate in the field of, is it a white springtail or a gray springtail? We have troglozines which are animals that come in for a little part of their life cycle, like cave crickets and bats. And then accidentals, like some of the cave spiders we have, or beetles or flies that come in just accidentally. Within Lehman Caves, we don't have a running stream or a water table that's right there. So most of the nutrients that come into the cave are coming in via guano. And so we call it a guano-based ecosystem. And then there are guanophiles or little critters that love to eat the guano that we might find near there. We do have, oh, I wanna give a special mention to bats because uh, bats are really cool. And bats are a big part of Lehman Caves. Oh, they originally were up in the natural entrance area and then when Absalom Lehman put a shack over the top of it, that closed out the bats. And so there were just occasional bats going into the cave. And that lasted until 1997 when a cupola was built on top of that natural cave entrance. That allowed the bats to be able to go into the cave again, but it took them about 20 years to really find it in a large number. And now we have a maternity colony of about 20 to 30 bats that hang out there in the summertime and the mothers give birth and, and nurse their babies there in the cave. And so we have researchers, including park staff, that are studying the bats and learning more about how these creatures have refound human caves. And if you like bats, the USA Cave Animal of the Year for 2022 is the little brown bat. And you can read a, more about it and that NSS News, the National Speleological Society News, um, and there's a free issue at caves.org backslash conservation. Let's go into some of the endemics. Endemics are species that are found nowhere else on earth. And so that makes me really excited because we have things that are so special here. And so we'll start up at the top. We have this snake range cave millipede. It had been in Lehman Caves for millennia and wasn't discovered until the early 2000s. And it was discovered right on the edge of the trail. And that just blew me away that this little tiny millipede, it's really, really tiny, um, could be hanging out in the cave for so long and nobody noticed it. And so it really does pay to kind of look closer and see what's there. And I love the Latin name that was given to it, Nevadesmus Ophimontis. I'm making my son study Latin. He's not thanking me for that, but I'm hoping someday he will appreciate it. Nevadesmus means Nevada, and then Ophimontis is snake range. So it's kind of fun when you can understand some of the Latin behind that. Then we've got this Great Basin Cave pseudoscorpion, uh, the Microcreagris grandis. And then we have some unknowns because we just don't have specialists who are able to name them yet. And so we send them off and sometimes they have to go into a deep freeze until the appropriate specialist can be found. But there are a couple of things that were just like, hmm, that looks like that might be totally different and hasn't been found anywhere else on earth. So the mystery continues, which is a lot of fun. Now we have a lot of critters that live in Lehman Caves but we have some that also live in other caves in the park. There are 39 other caves that we know about in the park. And some of the wetter and higher elevation caves have this model cave harvestman, the Sclerogonus ungulatus, beautiful orange color. And then also it comes in yellow color and a bigger millipede, the Great Basin Cave millipede, the Idagona limonensis. Now that, uh, talking about cave biota, brings me to some of the future things we're looking at, which is some of the Lehman Caves research projects. So one of the things that we've been doing for the past 15 years is Lehman Caves invertebrate biomonitoring. So four times a year, we go throughout the cave, including some of the off-trail places. 
we leave some bait, which is a little piece of rancid peanut butter, the older, the better. And you put it on a piece of flagging tape and fold it over and stick it under a rock. And then we come back um, 24 hours or a little bit later to see what has been attracted to that bait. And what we find is that sometimes it takes a lot of trips. In fact, it took 17 trips until we found our first Campodia dipleurin in Lehman Cave. And so that was, we know that there, there are there, but they are super rare in that cave. There are other caves in the park where we find them more frequently. And so we, that's something still to puzzle out. Why are they in those other caves and not so much in Lehman Cave? Another project is that's going on is looking at the origins of the cave by studying the geomicrobiology. And this is led by a PhD student, Zoe Havlina, and she recently got a grant from NASA because they are so interested in her work uh, because if she can figure out how Lehman Caves and some other caves started based on their geomicrobiology, that might help to show how caves on other planets started. So to me, it's just so cool that here we are at Great Basin National Park with a research grade observatory looking out into the night skies. And then when we go into the dark of the cave, there may be clues to how things are working out on little planets there too. So it's just kind of fun how it all circles around. Another really cool project is the sulfuric acid speleogenesis evidence led by Louise Hose. That's a mouthful, but you can learn more about this. And this is really cool because Louise is kind of rewriting what we know about the origins of Lehman Caves. And it is just so cool how we keep finding little clues that when we take them all together, we're getting a much better picture of how this cave started. And so tune in um, for the next virtual centennial lecture on May 4th, and you'll hear more about this subject from Louise. She's a great speaker, so I highly recommend her talk. We've also just started looking at carbon dioxide and how that affects the condensation corrosion in the cave. So if you've been in Lehman Caves, you notice that there are whole sections of ceilings that are really smooth. There are speleothems that have been partially corroded away, so they're, they're gone. We actually can see some places in the cave where we just see the little circles that used to be stalactites up there, but the stalactites themselves are gone. And that is due to condensation corrosion. Condensation corrosion occurs when we have seasonally elevated carbon dioxide. So when was it seasonally elevated? We didn't have any information. So we were able to put in some data loggers and get little periodic data. Um, and now I'm working with the USGS scientists so we can hopefully get more continuous data on this. And this is some preliminary data here where it shows um, last September where every day there's a peak um, when the tours go in and then it goes down in the evening. And we keep seeing this peak, and it's all between 2,500 and 3,000 part per million. Well, there is some literature that says anytime you get above 2,400 parts per million, that causes the condensation corrosion. And it looks like we have that from about July to October. So that might be several months where the cave is, instead of depositing more beautiful things, it's actually corroding away. So there's still lots more to be teased out of this and to gather, we need to gather more data to understand it better. And then it seems like when we get cold temperatures, the carbon dioxide plummets and then it'll go back up. And it's just so cool to still be learning new things about this cave that has been known for over a hundred years. We have uh, cave shields being studied by Morgan Hill. She came to the park as um, an intern and just did a, a lot of studying, trying to inventory every single cave shield we have in the cave. And she came up with more than 500. So it's one of the caves with the most cave shields in the world, which is super cool. Um, this summer, we have a returning um, intern Ryan Johnston, who is in college, and he wanted a, a fun project. <laughs> so I suggested a few, and he and his advisor decided that he was going to look more at the turnip stalactites. 
which we have a whole lot of these in the cave too. And we don't know how they form or where all of them are in the cave or how many there are. So there's a lot of just basic questions still to be answered about them. Another big project coming up is our Lehman Caves Infrastructure Project. And so this isn't research, but this is something that we're doing to try to help make the cave uh, more sustainable into the future. So we are going to take out the whole current cave lighting system, which was installed in 1977 and is showing quite a bit of corrosion in places and put in a new state of the art uh, uh, cave lighting system with a huge focus on sustainability and long-term maintenance so that we can have it last for at least another 40 or 50 years and then have lots of conduits so it's easy to change things out in the future when they need to be changed out. So that's been a lot of fun to work on. And when that goes in, which will be hopefully within the next couple of years, um, I invite you all to come back to the cave and take another look at it because the, what we've been trying to do is to light the cave so that it will highlight some of the best features of the cave more, some more of those clues of the hypogenic origins, to highlight some cave shields maybe you haven't really paid a lot of attention to, and to have more flexibility for the cave guides as they are giving the tours. We're also going to be working on improving some cave walkways and platforms, putting in more of a bench, a handrail, a door in the west room, so that we can make it easier for people to get through and safer, because if people are safer in the cave, there will be less damage in the cave. And then also we're trying to restore hydrologic connections and natural airflow in the cave. Oh, as we got ready for the, um, the cave lighting part, one of the things we did was we had a LIDAR scan of the cave led by Blaise LaSala. And this ended up as our Lehman Caves virtual tour. And this is available on the YouTube channel for Great Basin National Park. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit in case you haven't seen it because it is a pretty amazing um, video, I think. Oops, I'm gonna share the sound and keep going. Uh, keep going. Welcome to Great Basin National Park. We're about to take a virtual tour of Lehman Caves and head to the Grand Palace, the farthest section of the cave accessible on the tour. My name is Ranger Alicia, and I'll be your tour guide. Throughout the tour, we'll explore the history, geology, hydrology, and biology of the cave. During our time together, we will also explore the fundamental question of why life enters the cave in the first place. However, before we do so, it's critical to understand the answer won't be summarized in a single idea. This tool. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that, that there's, yeah, I can't summarize the cave in a single idea. There's so much more to it. We also are fortunate to have some funding from um, SNPLMA, the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act, um, to do work on some of the wild caves in the park. And so that um, will include a wild cave simulator trailer that visitors will be able to go through a fake cave that they can crawl through and try to avoid touching any of the speleothems and have that experience. Um, we're looking at doing a wild cave tour in Lehman Caves in the next few years doing another virtual cave tour, but there'll be a, a wild cave part of the cave and then more education and interpretation about caves. So there's lots of exciting things coming up dealing with caves in Great Basin National Park. So thank you for your time and for joining me on this talk. I hope you have uh, learned a little bit more about some of the things that are in Lehman Caves and realized there's still so much more to learn about. Thank you, Gretchen. That was super interesting um, when there were so many interesting topics. So we do have some questions and some comments. I, I do also want to um, to state again that I will send up a follow-up email to everyone who's attending tonight with some of these links. So the link to the virtual cave tour, as well as to the other centennial activities. 
Um, first, I'm going to start with just uh, a comment. Um, we had uh, Doug said that he believes that cold water holds more CO2 and that possibly might explain why the CO2 is lower when it's cold. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Thanks, yeah, I'll look into that. <laughs> Um, well, people are interested in Lint Camp. So can you explain how people get involved with Lint Camp? And I think that's another like link that I would be happy to send out when I send the follow-up email. Sure. So on the Great Basin National Park website, we do have a Lint Camp uh, page. So you can learn a little bit more about Lint Camp there. And then we do collect names. Um, and then in about November, we decide on our dates for the Lint Camp, which are generally sometime in Jan January, February, or early March. And then we'll send out a notice about the Lint Camp. And then folks can sign up um, to attend. And uh, yeah, we've had people come from close by from Baker and Ely. And we've had people come from other states like uh, Washington State, people have flown in specifically for it, and um, that from Virginia, people have happened to be kind of on, on a longer trip, but they've made their, their plans so they could include Lint Camp in their travels, so it's been really fun to have people from all over attend Lint Camp. Okay, so I'm going to start off with some other easier questions, then we'll go to the more in-depth ones here. So um, someone asked, what is a wild cave? Oh, great. So a wild cave is any undeveloped cave. So it doesn't have any uh, defined walkway as far as like a paved walkway, or it doesn't have electrical lighting in it. So uh, you have to have your own light to go into a wild cave. Another name is undeveloped cave, but wild cave is kind of fun because it, one thing I like to always remember is that all these caves are home to wildlife. And so calling them wild caves helps me to remember that. And, and how many wild caves are in Great Basin National Park? We know of 40 right now, but I think there's more. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question on the carbide. Um, would you be able to explain more about what that carbide is? I am not a carbide expert. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, after my experience with that hot water running down my face, I said, nope, I'm going to go with lights. And then fortunately, it went from incandescent lights to LED lights not too long after that. And I continue using LED headlamps uh, um, when I go into the cave. So um, uh, yeah, sorry. I, feel I, I don't have the answer on how carbide works in more detail. Okay, so my, my is making some noise back here, sorry. <laughs> um, so there is a question on um, whether the data on the CO2 might lead to reducing the cave tours as far as the frequency or the number of people. Um, hard to say, we do have a little bit of data from when the cave was closed in 2020. And we also, without any tourists in, in the cave that year, um, because it was just closed due to COVID, um, we also got to 3,000 parts per million with nobody in the cave. So it looks like a lot of it is due to natural causes, and there might just be little blips um, due to the tours going in, but it seems like it's probably going to get up to that 3,000 level, more or less, um, even if people aren't in the cave. Interesting. Um... So there is a question on um, the prevailing hypothesis of turnite, turnip stalactites. Um, could you, would you be able to tell us a little bit about how they're formed based upon, you know, the current research? So it, there hasn't really been much research. There's been a little speculation and you can find some in Cave Minerals of the World, which is an excellent book. Um, they talk about how maybe they are related to shields and welts and have kind of a, a slice in there, like a like a, a shield and welt are basically uh, kind of like an Oreo cookie. And so you got two layers and then the, the filling is where things are happening and where it's getting bigger. Um, but when we, I have seen some broken turnip stalactites or some that have corroded away and they look more like onions. I'm not seeing that plate in the middle, that medial crack. Um, so, and the authors of Cave Minerals of the World say, oh, it would be so nice if we could get a cross section of one to see what's really going on inside. So they're basically guessing from what they're seeing on the outside 
And so uh, there's a lot of room to figure out what might be happening um, from the many corroded ones we have in Lehman Caves. So I think it's kind of, you're like, oh no, at, at one point I thought, oh, you know, Lehman Caves is just gonna fill up with all these beautiful decorations and people won't be able to fit through anymore. And then when I started hearing more about condensation corrosion, I'm like, oh, parts of it are still opening up. And actually condensation corrosion is also taking us back in time by dissolving things away or corroding things away. And so that we're able to see how some of these speleothems formed. And so it's a neat, it's just kind of how you frame it, but I think there's some neat opportunities there. Right, it's that's really interesting. Um, we have a question on is this Lehman Caves or other caves in the park significant to the indigenous peoples, the native peoples in, in the Great Basin area? Yes, there certainly are several caves um, that are important. And so that we have upper and lower pictograph caves where there are amazing pictographs. And so there's been some work on that. And a big component of this upcoming Wild Caves project is we're going to have an archeologist on the team that's gonna be going out to inventory caves so we can get more information. We're also going to be doing a rock art assessment at upper and lower pictograph caves. And we're going to have an ethnographic assessment done for the overall view of caves in White Pine County, it's particularly in the park, but what the tribes um, think about the caves and how they have um, evolved through history or come down through history. Um, so a question, a, a creative question about lint. So a person has asked if, if you, if, if there's any caves that you know of that have tried um, like having people go through some kind of wind tunnel to get rid of the lint on the clothing before they enter. Yes, yeah, so Karsher Caverns tried that for a while and they um, didn't find that it helped that much. And so they stopped doing it because it was also blowing all this dust around. Um, so we considered that for a while. Um, there are caves that do try to mist people. A Karchner is another one that tries to mist people when they go in so that the lit will just stick to them. Um, but we don't have a very good water and drainage system that we can put into effect there. So what we're gonna be doing a little bit more um, in the upcoming years is to have people walk over some grates because a lot of things come off people's shoes while they're in the, the cave and then walking on more carpeting so that they can get more things off their the bottoms of their feet. Interesting. Um, so it looks like we got through most of the questions. Feel free to continue putting questions in here if you want. There was several about um, the carbon dioxide, but I feel like we went over that. Um, I feel like it would also be great to take a moment to talk, um, to just introduce our audience to the BioBlitz, if you would. I think um, people will be interested in learning about that. Sure. So Great Basin National Park has hosted BioBlitzes for over the last 10 years. Now, BioBlitz is a short-term event where we look at the biodiversity. And instead of looking at the biodiversity of everything, which could be kind of overwhelming, we've taken the approach that Acadia National Park started, which is we just look at one particular thing. So our first year we did it, we chose beetles. Um, that turned out to be the biggest order of invertebrates. <laughs> so it was a bit challenging, but it was it worked out really well. We uh, were able to have the Nevada State Entomologist come and a bunch of other entomologists, a bunch of students from um, Southern Utah University came and just a lot of interested people. And we had so much fun going out and collecting beetles and learning more about them. And so in subsequent years, we have concentrated on all sorts of different things. We did butterflies and moths one year. Uh, reptiles was last year. We've done birds, uh, crickets and grasshoppers, um, ants, bees, and wasps. And this year, we're going to focus on forest health. And so we have a bunch of entomologists coming who will talk to us more about what some of the beetles are and other insects that are impacting the forest that we have in the park. We also have folks that are will be um, looking at, oh, and hi, Kat, I'm glad <laughs> you joined. So it's great that we have some BioBlitz people here. Um, so, uh, and I think Kirsten's on here too. She's we have some artists that come to do artistry um, during the BioBlitz and help us think of the, 
the whatever we're focusing on in a different way. And so it's just been really, really fun to do these bio blitz and um, like kind of just, yeah, look at the park from through a different lens and uh, go, oh my goodness, there's still so much to learn here. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think it's it's really special for the public to be able to participate in these things like BioBlitz and Lent Camp and get to know the park on such a deeper level and have access to park rangers to ask questions and to learn from in such a deeper way. So um, we can also, you know, if people in the audience are interested in learning more about how you would um, sign up for BioBlitz, we can send that in a follow up email as well. Um, one uh, audience member asked that you uh, introduce your books and where people could get them. <laughs> so yeah, I have um, I wrote some books. Um, the first one I wrote was the Great Basin National Park, A Guide to the Park and Surrounding Area. And that stemmed from my husband who had asked questions about oh, how, how do you know the name of that area? And he'd be like, oh, well, so-and-so died there or they had a house there. Or, and I'm like, well, where is that written down? And he'd be like, uh, nowhere. And so I was like, oh my goodness, we need to start writing down some of these things. And so I did a bunch of interviews and then I just explored the park and the North Snake Range and the area with my husband. And it was so much fun to research. And so that um, culminated in a book that's available at the um, Western National Parks area bookstore. So, and then, and then, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, um, actually the bookstore manager, Claire Sorensen said, oh, sure. It would be nice to have a kid's book about that. And I'm like, oh, that wouldn't take that long to do. Well, a year later, <laughs> uh, the, the finally came out. And so that's a, been a fun book. And then I also wrote um, a short uh, murder mystery about caves that takes place in Ely mainly, but also a little bit in the park um, that I had come out for the 2016 um, NSS convention that was held in Ely. So, so that was, that was a lot of fun to write. And, but I, I have, I filled up my life with other things now. And so I don't do as much writing. <laughs> well, a few more questions have come in here. We'll see. I think we can probably get to them all. Um, so we have, I think, about four or five more questions that have come in. So uh, one of our uh, uh, audience members asked about, um, you mentioned about recently remapping the cave, and um, she is curious how someone can learn to map caves, like kind of what goes into that process. So the... Uh, it's really fun to map caves because you have to go slower in the cave. Um, and so you look at it in a lot more detail, but typically, well, I have it right here on my desk. We, you can use a tape measure and a compass and inclinometer. Um, so it's really simple tools. And then we also, we've upgraded to use these lasers that give us the distance to our next point and then our inclination and um, our azimuth. And so then we have another person who writes down all these numbers and uses a protractor and sketches in a little sketchbook. And so it's kind of um, a little, yeah, a little old fashioned way to do it, but it can be very accurate. And there are some instructional videos on YouTube if you want to learn about cave surveying. And then also you can check out the National Speleological Society. They have all sorts of different um, information about caves in general. Okay, so we have, um, what is your favorite part of the cave? And also, what is the silliest question you have ever gotten from a visitor? Um, so let's see, my favorite part in the cave is continually changing because I'll find something new and go, oh my goodness, I didn't know this existed. But I do I currently have a favorite a speleothem and that is on back in the Beeman Annex, there is a, it's sort of a lactite and sort of a column. I don't know which way to call it because it kind of curves as it touches the top and bottom. It doesn't go straight up and down, but um, there must have been some kind of thing that made it attractive to the top and bottom to connect. And so I just, I'm like, wow, it just baffles my brain. So I really like that. And then, um, yeah, the, the, the silliest question, but I can kind of understand it where it's coming from is, 
um, how much of the cave is underground? That is fun. <laughs> and it's like, I, I think the intent behind it is like, yeah, how much of the cave is actually there? Like, and, and like, we only know of two, about two miles for Lehman Caves that people can fit through. But I think the next thing that'll happen is that there is air blowing from a neat spot, but we'd have to break things to get into that. And so that's the next generation where we have drones and little robots that can go out there to explore what else there is, because there are plenty of other holes in the cave. They're just tiny. So um, a couple of questions relating to different animals in the cave. Um, one person is asking if the artificial lighting is, is affecting the wildlife in the cave. And, and another um, question on just what the predominant um, species are in the cave. I think you did cover, may have already covered that in the talk. So, um, so the most common cave species we have are those little tiny springtails. Um, sometimes we can count, one time there was one rock that just had hundreds of them on them. Um, so that, that's where we can count the most of things. Um, and the cave lighting can influence the cave biota by making that algae and moss grow, and then that's an artificial food source. And so we have a couple of spots in the cave where we just typically see those springtails there. They're just munching on that uh, moss and algae um, because they're like, oh, yeah, easy food. <laughs> and so it's sort of like, yeah, a, a salad bar that they really aren't supposed to be having in the cave. And the predominant bat species, that's the... Um, the Townsend's big-eared bat is the main bat species, yeah. Um, and I think I've gone through most of the questions. I do see uh, someone was requesting that you list the names of the books. And I do believe that um, you can access the Western National Parks Association online. So um, you probably could, um, if you're in the audience and wanted to purchase these online, you could probably do that. Did you want to just say what the names were? Or at oh, least yeah, like, um, yeah, Great Basin National Park, A Guide to the Park and Surrounding Area and then a kid's guide to the Great Basin and an unconventional murder. Well, what a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Um, I think, I'm sure that everyone learned something completely they, they had no idea about tonight. Um, so many interesting facts. And I just wanna also point out um, from the foundation how um, we are, very um, impressed by how the Park Service uh, manages the cave and puts so much effort into research and into making sure to really preserve and protect the cave. Um, it's, that's why national parks are so special is because they have that type of mission to, to be doing that, um, which is really great. So um, as a reminder, just for the people who were in here in the very beginning, um, we are having these virtual lectures um, the first Wednesday of each month um, until the early summer um, leading up to the grand celebration on August 6th at the park. Um, and so we're hoping to connect you to Great Basin National Park and to Lehman Caves from wherever you live. So please tell your friends and sign up for the other lectures. Um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we will have this Record it so um, if you missed any part of it or want to share it with someone else, um, you will be able to do that. It will be on our YouTube page um, by the end of the week. So uh, that's all. And um, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you.